All right. Hey, everybody. I'm Ashley Graham, and you are here on my podcast, Pretty Big Deal. Today, we're going to be tackling some of my favorite subjects, beauty, business, culture, and owning who you are. Don't forget to go to Pretty Big Deal on Instagram and Twitter. We want to hear from you. And don't forget to go to the Anchor app and leave me a little voice message because I'm going to be talking to you in the after party. I want to say what's up to Darcy Linda. My right hand lady. She's the best assistant in the whole freaking world. I'm so excited to announce today's guest. She's a journalist, trailblazer, activist, feminist, and my new BFF, Noor Tagori. Hi! Hi, beauty! Okay, hold on. So this podcast is called Pretty Big Deal. Pretty Big Deal. So does that mean I'm a pretty big deal? You're a pretty big deal. They're a pretty big deal. I'm a pretty Are big deal. Are you a pretty big deal? So we might as well just name the podcast Pretty Big Deal. This is the best. That's the best name ever. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, I'm so happy. Okay, so for all of you out there, just want to let you know, Nora and I became best friends in literally like 30 seconds. Yeah. We were on a beauty panel yeah. and you were wearing this cute little tuxedo outfit (laughs) I feel like I've known you longer than like less than a year like I think I've talked to you longer more than I've talked to a lot of people I've known for a lot longer so we met in the bathroom and then we had the panel and we just and I remember I was with my backpack and I was like (laughs) skipping I was like okay and you were like wait because cut to when I reenacted how we met I was like (laughs) hi I'm Noor it's so nice to meet you (laughs) And you were just so bubbly and happy. That's literally what happened. And then we got on the panel and you impressed me. I was like, this chick is hella smart and so well spoken. I mean, seriously, like I was like, okay, I want to be friends with her. Like she's, she's incredible. And also we're with the same agency. So that helped. That did help. And then I remember we were talking and then I said like on the panel, I, like, made a joke, and I was like, and we're just going to be best friends. And by the way, somebody from the agency two days ago, like, asked if we had stayed friends because they were like, it was instant chemistry on stage. I just want to know, like, is that – did you guys, like, become friends after that? And I was like, yeah, we actually did, and I remember because I was going to hit you up, and then I was just – after we were leaving, and then we took a selfie, and you literally took my phone and, like, put your number in it. (laughs) And I was just like, I guess we don't really have a choice. (laughs) We're Which, just gonna... by the way, I'm so not that chick. It was just no, like... No, I know. I, would have ne- I wouldn't have. I would even think that you are. It's just like, it was kind of like we just knew we had to do this. Yeah, exactly. And then we linked up and we had coffee with your amazing husband, Adam. Yeah. Had so much fun. And then... And we saw Ludacris. <laughs> what? We saw Ludacris. We saw Ludacris. What? This is like a very random story. Oh, Darcel, have you ever seen Ludacris? Yes, I have. <laughs> okay, so this is yeah. what happened. We're literally sitting... <laughs> In Soho House. And Nora's <laughs> telling this intense story. And she goes, isn't that ludicrous? Oh, and I was like, ludicrous. that is so ludicrous. I can't believe that happened. But then in her head, she was like, what kind of person uses that the word, word casu- casually? And then Nora starts laughing. And she goes, no, that's ludicrous oh, right no. there. <laughs> I was like, and we started laughing so hard. And his entire table just looked at us like. Yeah. Like we were. Like we were laughing at them. Yeah. And really, we were, they had nothing to do with it. But everything though. And then I kind of twisted your arm and Mm -hmm. asked you to come drive with me, and we were Thelma and Louise. Yeah, she asked me to. (laughs) She asked me to. You you asked me to drive up and down the coast of California four days before the trip started, (laughs) and was like, "Hey, can you come out to California and do this road trip with me?" And for charity, no joke. For it was for charity, right? But, like, the reason I knew it was meant to be was because that was the only five days I had free that summer. Yes. Yes. Like, only five days. And I was just like, there's no way this is random. It was a God thing. Yeah. And it... Later, we realized it really was a gut thing. It is, and we're going to talk about that. Place. Yeah. Because we realized how much we have in common through our faith, which I thought was so remarkable, especially coming from Christian and Muslim world. Totally. And then just being able to, like, have mm-hmm. these intense, amazing conversations. Because yeah. when you're stuck in a car with someone, it all comes out. Mm-hmm. And you know what happened? That's true. And, <laughs> like, and I remember thinking to myself, okay, we're in this car. We're going to be in this car for, like, 12 hours together. And, of course, we have to, like, take a bunch of content because right. this is, like, we're, I mean, we're trying to raise money and whatever. And I just remember we were driving, and I was like, wow, I think we took our phones out for a total of, like, 30 seconds. We didn't take much content. Yeah. I mean, you made Sorry. a really cute video, though. I did make a cute yeah. video, and and that was great. But also, <laughs> like, it just ended up being, like, I don't know. You know how I can summarize it? And I've, I've told people this because people have Aww. asked about our road trip. 
like it's so wild to me that I felt like my friendship with you brought me closer to God than yes. people who are of the same faith of me. Wow. wow. Isn't that wild? I got chills. Yeah. Because for you, your faith, you wear on your sleeve. Yeah. And for me, I mean, being a Christian woman, it wasn't something that I'm just like, I'm not wearing crosses all down my body and like, yeah. you know, being so like, I'm a Christian. I mean, kind of. I mean, uh, no, I I'm mean, but I, you really and like, and I'm posing for Sports Illustrated and, <laughs> and then people were like, oh, maybe that doesn't go hand in hand. But it was this natural conversation that I, that you let me have with you because you do have a hijab and because it is you are wearing your faith on your sleeve yeah. you allowed me to just be like so why did you choose to have the hijab tell me about muslim yeah, totally. tell me about islam tell me about like what it is it all mean and when you get to be so honest and open with someone that's when you're able to learn exactly and it was like the perfect breeding ground for just learning because I ended up learning so much from you and then even your husband because we ended up like calling oh, him yeah, at 3 a.m. <laughs> because we were having this deep conversation the about best. spirituality and Justin like answers the phone he's like hello and and then <laughs> Ash is like hey can you tell Nora about like this concept and then he starts no, we were like, talking about spiritual <gasps> warfare yeah yes oh my gosh yeah yeah it was a great and I just Shout out to him hey, for staying up hey with us Justin. and having those conversations. <laughs> He's the best. I still really it's appreciate it. And I remembered that that was one of my best. favorite conversations we had. I always tell like my family um, when Justin came in and we had a lot of like race conversations. I was like, all you need to do is just ask. And if you ask out of love, yeah. then then he's going to answer out of love. But you have to ask because he doesn't want to be a black man in this white family when he comes back to Nebraska with me and have nobody want to talk about race with him. Right. And I'm sure that you've felt like that as well growing up in Maryland, being the yeah. only hijabi girl in a in a very white school. Like, yeah. well, what, what I was actually your didn't have so. I walked into my first grade class and I sat down next to the only other girl with dark brown hair and asked her if she was Muslim because I had never seen wow. another girl with dark brown hair. I didn't have the courage to put on the hijab in that town. I didn't put it on until after we moved. My mom was like the At only- At what age are you, can you put it on very young? So you can put it on whenever you want. Okay. Um, you're supposed to put it on once you get your period. Right. Um, I because didn't that's like do becoming that. a woman. Yeah. Okay. I didn't do that. Um, I put it on when I was- turning 16 years old. My mom put it on in Selma, Alabama after I was born. Wow. Um, so it's one of those things that like you really have to be, I, I'm weary about saying be ready to do. It just has to be something in your heart because I don't think you're ever completely ready to like put on your identity or wear something like that on your sleeve. Well, it's like a personal relationship with, with God that it's you, that 100%. you have. 100%. And mm -hmm. that's, it's literally something that's only between you and him, mm -hmm. which is why when people like assume or say things or, or ask like, oh, did you wear that for your dad or did you wear that for your husband? Mm -hmm. I'm like, it has literally nothing to do with them. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a direct relationship with me and God. And it also gives me like the courage and strength to maintain a sense of identity in a world where it's really, really hard to find yourself. And on top of that, it's something that, to me personally, keeps me so grounded because I know who I am. I know what I represent. And then I also... And it's also, a daily reminder. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's a daily reminder of, to me, living for something bigger than myself. Mm -hmm. So when I step foot outside, I know that like I am on this planet to do good and to serve other people and like try to do my best to like leave a footprint because I'm doing everything with the intention of pleasing God. I love that. Thanks. I love that. I really do. What was the moment like for you when you first put on the hijab? Because I could imagine like for so long you didn't have it. Yeah. And then your mom was wearing it. Yeah, my mom was wearing it. And to be honest with you, before I wore it, my little sister was wearing it. Oh, so my wow. little sister like wore it when she was 12. But even my parents were like, are you sure you want to do that right now? Like, And it was something that she was super committed to. And growing up, I swore I would never wear it. Really? Yeah. I n always did. I actually have a recording of my mom that I use in my talks now of me and her talking about like when I put it on and when she put it on. And She, she recorded you talking? No, 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 no. Oh. I recorded. I wanted to have this conversation. Got it. Because you're a journalist. To share with people yeah. because I'm a journalist. Um, and literally, I was like, keep the receipts on your mother, please. <laughs> <laughs> 
Mama, Mama I got the receipts. Yeah. I know what you said. <laughs> you know, oh my gosh, I have to thank her for even doing that because she gets so nervous about Aww. like just being on camera, being on voice recording, and I use it in my talks now, and I play it for thousands of people. But there was a question <laughs> that I asked her, and I said, well, how did you feel when I put it on? And she was like, well, if I'm being completely honest with you, I didn't even think you would keep it on, so it didn't really matter to me. And she was like, I believed in you and a lot of other things, but with that, I was just like, that's just not something that... Because I was so against it. And the reason I was so against it was because growing up, I thought that the only way I was going to be on television, which I knew I wanted to be a journalist since, right. like before I even knew what that word meant. Mm -hmm. And the only way I was going to be on television is if I looked like the people I saw on television. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, never going to wear that. Couldn't stand it. Couldn't stand the fact that like my mom looked different than anybody else. Couldn't stand the fact that like the kids in my school would be like, cause my mom was a guidance counselor and she would like surprise me and bring me lunch. And I remember like the only thing I used to pray for as a kid is that, that she, she would, would forget it. Yeah. yeah. And so, and, and now she knows all of this, and she's like, I mean, I totally get that, and I understand. Mm -hmm. um, but it was one of those things where no one really thought it. And I would, it just like, yeah, it just didn't seem like something that I would do. And so when I did it, it was because I was really struggling with my identity. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, who do I want to be? Mm -hmm. Because I have spent so much time trying to be like other people. Mm -hmm. Like, I had periods of time when I would – like dye my hair blonde and wear colored contacts. Who were you I, looking at that you wanted to be like? So at the time, the people that we were watching, because we didn't have social media at the time, mm -hmm. was like Paris Hilton and Nicole Richie on The Simple Life. Oh yeah, I definitely watched and, that. Which I loved, so like I would watch it with my mom. Yeah. But it was like that and whatever I would watch on like the Disney channel and everybody I saw was like blonde hair and blue eyed mm -hmm. and I was like, this is what people on television look like, which is also why my absolute biggest inspiration growing up was Oprah Winfrey because yeah, right. she was like the first of many. Mm -hmm. She was a legend and she was somebody who constantly maintained her identity mm -hmm. and it wasn't, and I remember like there's a girl who messaged me a few years ago and she was like, I remember in third grade on the bus where you used to say like, I'm going to be Oprah when I grow up. And I used to swear that. Like, I was like, this is what I'm going to do. Ditto. And it was because, like, Did that. Did you say ditto? What? Oh, please. I think every, but I think everybody. <laughs> you want to be Oprah? Oprah. Everybody. everybody. Did it. Excuse me. You never told me I that. I had a party on the last day, and I was sobbing on our last show day. Oh, my God. At right? Dying. I was so Dying. upset. You know, I was so upset because growing up, like, my aunt always told me, like, one day I was going to be in the audience of Oprah. And when oh. I found out she was, like, canceling her show. And you would never have the opportunity. I was <laughs> you were devastated. devastated. Like, right now, like, my heart hurts a little bit just saying that because I was, like, really upset. But, she and, but you'll be able to – have you met her yet? I was on her network. I haven't met her yet, but I know I'm, like – Casual <laughs> on her network. You met her. Yeah, we, we, we held hands. Yeah, like, that's a big we deal. A <laughs> but you know what? She's like, like the only. I ambushed you... her though. I totally ambushed her. But you can. Yeah, she did. She wasn't like into the ambush. Oh. <laughs> if it weren't for Gail King and like she's amazing. I mean, and Gail being like, "Hey, do me a favor here." I don't know what Gail said to Oprah, mm -hmm. but basically she was like, she Gail put her back to me, said something to Oprah, and Oprah goes, "Come here." And like I went and reached hands with her, and we took pictures, and then I was like. I love you. You're on my vision board. Your goals. <laughs> you're, you're, my everything. you're on my vision board. Oh my she was gosh. like, mm -hmm. she was so like, anyways. Everything. And honestly, like, I don't even know what I would say. Cause I feel like anything I would say, everybody said to her before. Ex that's the thing. And you, it, with Oprah, everybody said everything. So I feel like, and if I just started talking about myself, she'd be like, that's nice, dear. So I think like, <laughs> I, I don't know. It's like, what do you say to Oprah except for thank you? There's never enough gratitude to spread. I want to talk, but I want to talk about Oprah, but I also want to talk also, uh, what did you want to say? Well, you I just, let me, let me like, like <laughs> wrap, you know what it is, is I always have to wrap up my thoughts. It's like okay, a little no, journalist it. thing in me, like do I got to finish yeah, my thoughts. So it. my thought was, okay, Oprah was the first of many. And so then when I, when I was dealing with this identity crisis and I put on the hijab, I remember like holding it and looking in the mirror mm -hmm. and saying to myself, if she was the first, I can be too. Yeah. Wow. And that was the promise I made myself. And and so there's like one thing that I that a lot of people don't really know about kind of my journey because a lot of people found out about me when I 
publicly said, like, I'm going to be the first hijabi anchor on American television. But the fact of the matter is it was a thing that I was going to do from when I was a child. And that was literally me putting it into the universe Mm -hmm. and saying, this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to make it happen. So it was something that I always wanted to do regardless. And literally after I put on the hijab, my mom was like, why don't you just homeschool the rest of your high school and start college at 16 so you can get a head start? And I was like, done. I can leave high school. Hell yeah. Mind blown. Yeah. And then I did it. Like, so it was just you. like destiny. Yeah, totally. Circle. My parents are the only reason I am where I am today. Did you have this moment where you were like, I am going to be a storyteller? So I, growing up, I was very good at asking questions and telling stories. I wasn't really good at like sports. I wasn't really good at art. But like I could talk anyone's ear off. She's and a chatty I, Kathy. I love yeah, it. but like so. But are I you. like it. <laughs> <laughs> like we match. Like that's why we like have to like exactly. pause and take breaths in between our conversations because yes. it's like. Ooh. But we also in the car, like we were allowing each other to speak, and then we'd be like, and yes, and this, and yeah. this. But no, we it would was have to. So beautiful. It really was. Yeah, we could have recorded the entire thing and made it just this podcast. Oh my god! And then and we would have broken the internet. Video. Yeah, that's honestly though. With the amount of questions we asked each other about our faith and yeah, sex dude. and dating that was, and. All of it, it was just like, wow. It was beautiful. It was awesome. I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for you. Thanks. Was there a groundbreaking moment for you where you were like, okay, this is a story I want to tell and I want people to hear it from my point of view? Yeah. Uh, Oh, there is. No. Oh, good. Totally. Oh, I want to hear about it. So I got my, so I got this like dream job, right, as a local news reporter, which was something that I was working towards my entire life. Mm -hmm. And... I still had, it wasn't easy. Like it wasn't easy to go out and talk to strangers because my videographer was a young black woman with dreads and I'm a hijabi and people Mm -hmm. thought we didn't belong. Like Mm -hmm. people would literally be like, "Um, are you guys sure you're at the right place? And so one in April, 2015, when um, Freddie Gray was murdered, there were protests in Baltimore and I was asked to go cover the story. And I remember outside of city hall, there were all of these like media trucks and everybody was eating like sandwiches out of brown paper bags. And uh, we had to cover this like standard story and we start walking to our car and this like young white guy who was like a little bit high, like was beaming with a smile and looked at us and was like, walk down a couple of blocks and you'll see one of the most beautiful things you've ever seen. And so we did it. And when we got there, it was so beautiful and everybody was outside of their homes wearing I bleed orange was the color for Baltimore mm-hmm. Orioles, Orioles, um, their shirts, they were dancing and crying and laughing. And there was a Michael Jackson impersonator standing on top of dancing on top of a car and people were coming up to us saying, can I share my story with you? And not a single. Because you were single, there with a the camera and yeah, they knew that they could get no it And no one else was there with a the camera and they they knew they could trust us right because mm-hmm. they knew that we were minorities like them exactly and so I remember Erica my videographer at the time and I looked at each other and we started crying and we mm. were like wow like this is the story that we are meant to tell mm. and after we did that story I quit my job at the station and I pursued a documentary on my own um, and I shot it on like a broken camera and basically was like I'm going to find the stories that are often misrepresented in our community and the subcultures of America that people don't get to see. And also people don't really get to build trust with because right. oftentimes the media is distrusted because we do oftentimes misrepresent people. And and, and no one ever asks, like, how is the way I'm covering the story going to affect the, communi- the communities I'm talking about? Right. And that was a question that I had to develop on my own. And so bringing it back to, like, even just putting on hijab, this was never something I even thought about, right. like, going into journalism. I never thought about what it was like to be misrepresented or to be a minority. And when I got to that place, because before I like while I was doing job interviews and trying to get hired, people would ask me like if I could take it off. Mm-hmm. They were like, can't you just take it off for the job? Isn't that so disrespectful? Yeah. Yeah, it absolutely is because I wouldn't ask you to take off your identity. But also like it just it, what's sad about it is that they don't realize that for you to be successful media outlet, you need to be representative of the people in your community. And America is an incredibly diverse place. Right. And yet we still don't care enough to diversify and be inclusive of everybody that it entails. Right. So anyway, um, I made a promise to myself that those were the stories that I was going to cover. And eventually, when you put that intention out there, it just it skyrocketed. Happens. Yeah, totally. Are you a vision board girl or? Oh my gosh, I'm... <laughs> 
beyond a vision board girl. I like got Adam into vision boarding my husband and I've gotten my sisters into I actually made a YouTube video on how to make a vision board. What's your I like what's your it. what's your thing? Do you like get a like a cardboard and you like cut things out of Google and So blah, blah, blah. I I'm like super organized. I at first I wanted to like spend time like cutting up stuff from magazines and then I was like I know exactly what I want and who I want to become. I'm just going to make it myself. And so I just like write out everything in like a specific font and they're all affirmations oh it's all words no pictures and then I add photos to each thing and I use like Pinterest and stuff to like find it and I just like try to make it super organized and sometimes like I'll even use photos of like myself or things that I've already done to envision yourself in it exactly well so the the reason the photo that like went viral of mine in 2011 or 2012 was of me sitting at an anchor desk and then the anchor po- took a picture of me and I posted it as my Facebook picture and I said, this is what my dream looks like and I'm going to make it happen. Mm. And at the time, I was obsessively shadowing journalists. Like mm. obs- I would email hundreds and hundreds of people and I was like, hey, can I bring a cup of coffee to your work? Hey, can I bring lunch to your work? You're Even just a if little it's hustler. Free- Oh my gosh, I didn't sleep. Mm -hmm. Like I was always, 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 and I would always introduce myself as a broadcast journalism major, even if when I wasn't, Mm -hmm. and ended up getting like an internship offer randomly on stage one day because that's how I introduced myself. I put everything I wanted out there. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. Seriously, just please. This is why you're my best friend. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so there's this. Really interesting thing that Balmain has just done. You know Balmain, the, yeah, the, the designer, yeah. um, the fashion brand. Um, so they're using these models now. It's CGI models, and it looks like it looks like Facetune on steroids. To be completely honest, and they're modeling the clothes. They're they're pushing they them on social people? media. No, but they've named them. They've totally named them, and and I want to know like. From a fa- from a brand standpoint, I think it's interesting because it generates like conversation and, right. and it's like you know we're moving in that the that direction of everything going kind of AI. But what do you think that does for the perception of beauty and fashion mm. in the culture that we're in today? That's a great conversation because that was one of the things. Sorry, that was one of the things that we talked about in terms of just like how we choose to represent ourselves on social media or on camera and the honesty that we want to like portray in who we are um and so I struggled a lot growing up with like obviously the color of my hair I remember somebody told me like you have really beautiful eyes at my dad's work and I told Mm -hmm. them like no my eyes aren't pretty because they're not blue Wow. And, like, I had this, like, really distorted – and, you know, and what's wild is that, like, my mom always, like, did, like, affirmations in the mirror and, like, would say, like, who's that beautiful girl? And, like, as amazing as that is, when you're growing up, like, for me, that wasn't enough because I didn't see it everywhere else, right? right. And so I remember I struggled a lot with, like, makeup and just, like, going out of the house without makeup. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh, I would have to have, like, makeup on to, like, look beautiful and stuff. And so I got to a point – where I just like stopped wearing it when I would go out just to like relearn to like love myself. Mm -hmm. And I made this video like called I'm not tired because I was so tired of people asking me like, are you tired when I wouldn't wear anything on my face? And, um, (laughs) isn't that the worst? Yeah, it really is. Cause I'm just like, no, actually I had eight hours of sleep. Like I didn't have eight hours of sleep. I feel real good. I felt really good. I just decided not to wear mascara. Exactly. It's interesting because I wonder what their intention behind it is. Um, I wonder too. I I don't really know. Is it to tap into like AI and be like super different and cool? Um, or are we having like honest conversations of what beauty standards are and what, you know, people like a lot of beauty brands build their reputation and make a lot of money on people's insecurities. Yes. And so instead of being honest with like, hey, I have like acne or freckles or But the brands that are thriving right now are the ones that are talking about like, oh, I've got back fat. Oh, I've... But hi, guess what? That was what our New York... The reason we bonded so much was because our conversation at the panel in New York Fashion Week was literally on this topic. Mm -hmm. And it was on changing the face of beauty. And what does that actually look like? I want my little sisters to be able to look up at beauty ads or fashion ads and be able to say, hey, that looks kind of like me. I would look great in that. That's why they need people who have 
who look like us. All right. Uh, everybody, I'd love to hear all of your thoughts on all this knowledge that Noor is pouring onto all of us. So make sure you go to that Anchor app. Leave me a little voice message. They can and leave I'll, voice messages? You can leave a voice message. That's awesome. And I can talk back to them. I know. And it's all in the after show. Okay, so I want to talk about Sold in America Ooh, because yeah. this is groundbreaking. Um, the podcast is coming out. The podcast trailer actually dropped today, <laughs> and the first episode comes out October 10th. However, um, so the documentary came out earlier this year, right. and the podcast spin off. So, Sold in America is yes, tell us everything. An investigative report on the sex trade in the U.S. And it started out as something that was solely on sex trafficking. And then when I started doing the reporting, I was like, oh, wait, I can't actually cover trafficking in the U.S. without covering the entire sex trade in the U.S. Mm -hmm. so that people truly understand it and that we do right by the story. And so it was supposed to, it was started out as like a few months and now it's been like two years that we've been reporting on this. Um, so the podcast is like a deeply personal, deeply reported eight episode piece. Um, so many people have worked on it. It's been an incredibly challenging and rewarding two years because mm -hmm. this is a topic that I've been passionate about since I was like 14. Mm -hmm. um, and Wait, why have you been so passionate about sex trafficking? So this is actually in the, so this is actually in the first episode. Um, and it's like the first time that I really talk about this publicly, but I experienced like my first encounter with sexual violence was when I was 12 mm -hmm. um, and it involved a stranger in an elevator and it was very, very traumatizing. And um, I remember, of course, Oprah comes back into the story. <laughs> I remember Oprah brought on Nicholas Kristoff and Cheryl Wudun, who are these mm. two journalists, and they had covered um, trafficking in Asia and they had written this book called Half the Sky. And I immediately bought it and I read the stories of girls who were uh, exploited and I was devastated because I, I physically could not understand what they had gone through and I couldn't understand that that existed. Mm -hmm. And so I promised myself that like, if that was so traumatizing for me, then I couldn't imagine what they had gone through. And I wanted to dedicate myself to this, this cause. Um, I, I believe that like finding your purpose is combining causes that pain you with your skills and your talents. And, and you had, Oh, sorry. I didn't no, go ahead. No, go ahead. So, like, my skill was storytelling, and these were the causes that pained me, so I wanted mm -hmm. to, to talk about these people. And, and so, it's an experience that you had also gone through. Yeah. Not on the level that they've gone through, but that's, but still. But that's literally where the passion came from. Mm -hmm. And so I... Um, so I was obsessed with it. I like wrote papers on it. My first report um, that I did in local news was on a trafficking survivor in DC. And then this was like the first docu-series that I pitched when um, I later got a job in digital. And so this was something that I was like committed to doing because I was living in DC at the time and the exploitation that was happening to young people there and people across whatever age, um, was happening while you could see the U.S. Capitol in the background. And it and to me, that was very disturbing. Yeah. So we spent these two years um, traveling across the country and doing reporting on sexual exploitation and survival sex and the decriminalization movement of sex work and actual legal prostitution. What was the biggest thing that you learned that you thought, oh my God, I can't, this is something that I never thought would be in this series? So for sure, I think like the biggest realization I had was that the re like that our society as a whole, and it was, it was something that I think I like knew, but I didn't see it with my own two eyes was we have such a lack of a social safety net right. for people at the margins of our communities. Mm. And so when people talk about sex work in general, it's always seen with like this moral lens, right? And this like moral viewpoint and this moral compass. And, and you broke it. You actually like proved that there was like reasoning why women or even men were doing what they were doing. Oh, absolutely. Doing. It yeah. wasn't, and people would ask me like, oh, like how do you feel covering this topic? How does your family, whatever. And they would bring up the word morals. And I was like, you know what's immoral? What's immoral is the fact that 
in the United States of America, we are experiencing a housing crisis and mm-hmm. there are people who cannot afford to live anywhere. Mm-hmm. There are families who can't put food on their tables and there are people who are experiencing the disease of addiction and we don't have the facilities and the resources to help them mm-hmm. the way that we need to. That's what's immoral. Mm-hmm. And there are people who who engage in trading sex because that's what they want to be doing. But the laws surrounding sex work affect everybody involved. They affect the people who are being trafficked. They affect the people engaging in survival sex. And they affect the people who are doing sex work consensually. Mm-hmm. And what happens is when laws are made, they everybody on the spectrum are not taken into consideration. So earlier this year, um, a law passed called FOSTA-SESTA, which is like the Stop Sex Trafficking Act. Um, And basically it holds websites all over the internet accountable for like the trading of sex for money or food or whatever. And so sites like Craigslist have to take down their uh, personal page or like websites and forums and um, message boards where like sex workers would put bad like date lists on to like be like, okay, make sure you stay away from this man. Like all of that was taken down and it was in an effort to end trafficking. Hmm. But the people who passed the laws didn't talk to sex workers in the process. And now there are people engaging in sex work who are dying. surface. Right. Because they're like, oh, if we take down these sites, sex trafficking will end. And while it's like well-intended, one, sex trafficking is not going to end. And two, people are actually it's more harmful. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is a lot of people with good intentions end up hurting a lot of vulnerable people. And there's like this huge lack of communication. Mm -hmm. And And also I just want to add for everybody watching, Nor was in the middle of filming and then she went and got married. Oh, like I had to schedule my wedding in. Yeah. And to be honest with you, like, and Adam's like looking at my husband's like side eyeing me because two days before my wedding, I spent a couple of days with, men who are arrested for buying sex and then at the at the bunny ranch right well so we went to the bunny ranch i don't remember if i went to the bunny ranch before or after but no oh. i was in seattle and i was oh. spending time in these classes that men had to take after being arrested for buying sex and it was just like a very weird oh. experience and then like after my wedding we were in covington kentucky covering like the opioid crisis and i had like witnessed my first heroin overdose and so it was a very – I feel bad for Adam because, like, he got thrown into, like, hey, let's get married and then, like, let you deal with all of the crap that I'm going through. And then probably a few months after we got married, I was so – I was in such a dark place that I, like, stopped filming for two weeks and I went to a self-care retreat and I was like, I need help. Like, I can't. Good for you because I was just about to ask you, like, how do you keep your mental stability and your emotional stability – even when you're going through so much crisis after crisis when you're talking to these people. So I think that's part of why I'm really excited for the podcast is because um, I talk about like the personal aspect of all of this. Mm -hmm. In the documentary, it was very like documentary objective. And then in the podcast, I'm like, this was my personal journey going through this and here's the Mm -hmm. reporting. Mm -hmm. Um, And journalists usually don't do that. Yeah, but I do that. And Mm -hmm. that's why I like, I'm so firm in the way that I tell stories is because like I'm, as honest as I possibly can be and Mm -hmm. as vulnerable as I possibly can be because I don't think that people like owe us their stories Mm -hmm. and I don't think that it's fair if we're not honest with the people who are consuming our stories unless like we create this like open openness and like vulnerability and I'm just like hey this is what I went through because listening to the podcast or watching the documentary isn't easy either Mm -mm. and um and one thing like it's definitely worth the watch, you guys. You've got to check it out. Thank you. It's it's, it's phenomenal. Thank you. Um, so getting back to, like, how you deal with it, like, the, I remember there was one night where we were driving around D.C. just to, like, watch what happens at night. And um, we were driving around with, like, former cops and watching people engaging in sex work. And while we couldn't tell who was engaging in it consensually and who wasn't, there were times where we saw, like, I saw people who looked like my sister's age, and my sister just turned 13. Mm. And I remember, like, coming home that night and just, like, crying myself to sleep Mm. because it's, like, one of those things where you couldn't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was really hard to see, but also, like, for a lot of people who are going through that, that's actually, like, that's their life that's her life and there was one survivor i talked to do anything well 
except for tell their story except I for hope make a and like get people yeah and to me that's like my form of activism mm -hmm. is like storytelling mm -hmm. I don't really go out with like posters and protests but I tell you guys mm -hmm. stories in the most true and honest way I can mm -hmm. and try to be as accurately representative of representative of the people that I'm talking about um and I just want people to be informed yeah because when yeah. you know that it's happening you're able to like see things. My family and I, we have been helping That's right, people. Your mom. Yeah, my mom is an angel. Mm -hmm. um, we've been helping people who experience homelessness for like the last 10 years. So mm -hmm. we'll do like grocery runs for a women's shelter in Baltimore. We do welcome care packages, hygiene, hygiene care packages, and um, winter care packages, and we pass them out. Mm -hmm. And every time we would pass them out, we would ask people like, hey, what do you need? Because we learned like you can't put, um, hard like granola bars in those bags because some people may not Can't be able chew. to chew them right um what like the certain hygiene things people are missing and then um the other day when we were out there not the other day earlier this year uh we asked this couple and the woman just said like we just need to be seen mm. and so that really was profound and like stuck with us and um, so as of like last week, my family and I launched a foundation called I See You yeah. to wow. like actually like solidify and like scale wow. these efforts for people experiencing homelessness. And I think the narrative is just like, just like, even if you don't have anything on you to give, just like smile, like Say stop hello. looking away Yeah. Um, because people are not something to be ashamed mm -hmm. of. Mm -hmm. Just look and smile and Either, whether it's a prayer or a donation or asking like, hey, how are you today? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All of that makes a huge difference. It does. And, and just to wrap up Sold in America, where can people watch it and listen to it? So you can watch Sold in America on my Facebook page, facebook.com backslash nor. All three episodes are up there. And the podcast, which the trailer dropped today and the first episode comes out October 10th um, for eight weeks. And that is on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. It's called Sold in America. <laughs> I sound like I just read yeah, my thing, yeah, right? Yeah. Because I was just <laughs> tracking it yesterday. Yeah. And I'm just like, wow, I've said this so many times. Um, so you're also working with Girl Boss. Yeah, so I have two <laughs> podcasts coming out. Because um, you're a girl boss. Yeah, I'm hey, doing a podcast hey. with Girl Boss because I'm a girl boss. Hey. So there's there's a couple of things. So obviously there's this investigative journalist side of me. Right. And then I also tour in and I talk about breaking barriers through storytelling and finding your passion. So You I've talk to like a magnitude of people. There was something on your story recently where you were like, there, you were in an auditorium yeah. and it was like loaded with people. Yeah, yeah. I, that was a couple thousand people. It was one of the most beautiful um, speaking engagements I've ever had. It was really amazing. It was in Calgary. And I talk about breaking barriers mm -hmm. through storytelling. And so the podcast that I'm doing with Girl Boss is called In Progress, An Imperfect Journey Navigated. And so I talk to five different women. It's 10 episodes on finding your purpose, how to um, pursue certain goals, how to take the plunge, mm -hmm. and everything in between. And it was really very, very powerful conversations. Mm -hmm. So um, – for everybody who listens to the podcast, I gave you a little positive and then a little investigative, and <laughs> that's pretty much who I am. That's awesome. Yeah. I can't wait to – when does that come out? That comes out September 28th, so by the time you see this, it'll be out. It'll be out. Yay. It's probably out right now. It's out right now. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's this weekend. Uh, yeah, I just realized. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so something that we're doing now on Pretty Big Deal is that we are highlighting an initiative or a person that is a pretty big deal in their own world that's changing the course of the world that we live in today. And today we are highlighting Jessica Castro, who is a dancer, and she's toured with Beyonce and Rihanna and Janet, and she recently wrote a piece for Elle, and it's a letter to a young dancer. And it's really beautiful. Beautiful. The video is gorgeous, but she talks about how you have to face your fears. You have to realize that no one is perfect and you have to go after your dreams and goals. And it's just another reminder for all the young people out there, like to just go after what you want Absolutely. and to, and to one, something that I always have to remind myself that I had a mentor tell me in the past is start before you're ready. And if you start before you're ready, there's going to be no there's going to be no roadblock in front of you that's going to keep you from doing what you want to do. I love that. Right? There's something that I thought about recently that I was talking to Adam about and it was like we take role models and people who inspire us and it's amazing, but I truly believe to like unlock your fullest potential, make sure you just try to be the 
best version of yourself. Nor I say <laughs> be your own role model. Yeah. I say that yeah? in okay. speeches. <laughs> really? Yes. Can I tell you why? Because here's the thing. When you take people as your role model, which is amazing, and take you're the putting good them, from them here. You're putting them here. But guess what? They're imperfect too. So yes. here is a ceiling. Yes. And you don't want there to be a ceiling. So in yes. order to unlock your fullest potential, you have to be like, I can do absolutely any. Right. And if I can do it, because I can't tell you how many powerful people said no to me. Mm -hmm. If I can do it, you absolutely can. The same thing happened to me with Oprah. I was always like, I'm going to be the next Oprah. I'm going to like every other kid, right? Anyways, I was listening to this podcast and one of Oprah's producers was um, talking about how every single person comes up to her and says, I'm going to be the next Oprah. I'm going to be the next Oprah. And if she could have a dollar for any person who mm -hmm. came up to her and said, I'm going to be the next Oprah, she would be filthy rich. And I yeah. thought, oh my God, I'm not going to be the next Oprah because I'm Ashley Graham. Say it. Okay. And there... Did you have the same aha hold moment? On, because on. yeah, once we've done this, I'm gonna like okay, yes. this is magic. And it and it hit me because Oprah was the queen of the '80s and the '90s, and she is like she's a god in in so many people's lives today. That that made it. She and, really needs to watch this, right? But she, please. Um, <laughs> but there was this. But there, I had this incredible moment, uh, and it was like a magnitude of overwhelming emotion because I was at this place called the ashram, and I was climbing up a hill, and I was on my my like seventh mile, and I started crying because I was like alone, and I was like, I'm not gonna be Oprah, I'm not crying tears of sadness, but of joy. I'm not going to be Oprah. I'm going to be Ashley Graham. And like here I am in my career where I am today. And I still said I'm going to be Ashley Graham because I feel like I still have so much more potential. Totally. And, and so many more places to go. And that's exactly what I want other people to know is you can't put – a roadblock, I keep saying roadblock because that's how I always have seen this as like a role model roadblock in front of you and say like, that's where I'm headed. You have to see through that person, yep. understand what they've done, understand their Ooh, mistakes and then run through that and go on the other side and have that be where you end up. Yeah. And, and it was just, it was just an incredible moment that for me, so and I was magical. like, "Oprah, you're still queen." Yeah, but, but I'm, I'm gonna be. But me. I'm. But I'm gonna be me. So I have two things to touch on that that like are perfect yeah. on this story. This is how I know like me and you are literally on the same brainwave. One, my favorite quote ever, Oprah quoted Maya Angelou. Yes, and said, "You said I, this in your TED talk." Yeah, I did. I come as one, or I stand as one, but I come as ten thousand. Mm -hmm. So owed to all of the 10,000 that came before us because the only reason I am where I am today is because so many people fought and and like couldn't do it and right. but made it easier. Last night I was in a, at an event with Lena Waithe and she said um like I I recognized that there were women clawing at the door and pounding at it so that by the time I got to that door I just had to turn the right. doorknob mm -hmm. and open and go mm -hmm. through. That's amazing and that re really resonated with me because I recognize that there is a that why the reason I am where I am right now is because of the moment in time and because it was meant to be. And the second thing is just a reminder about Oprah being human as well. When Oprah was an anchor at in Baltimore. <laughs> I know what you're going to say. The Bo Barbara Walter yeah. story? Yeah. yeah that's yeah. why I was asking you. That's what you were going to yeah. share. So this is when I realized I was going to be the best in Ortegori because Oprah had a moment where she was trying to be Barbara Walters, and so she used to try to speak like Barbara Walters. And then on <laughs> camera, she said, instead of saying Canada, she said, Canada. No. <laughs> and yeah, that's that Isn't was that her so story. Funny? And then she laughed at herself on television, and she said, at that very moment, I realized I can't be Barbara Walters, but I can be Oprah Winfrey. Yep. And so that's why she became, and she says, like, had I, if I would have known how rich. Or no, if I would have known um, to like truly be my most authentic self a lot sooner, I would be a lot richer. Mm -hmm. And like I, that just stuck with me. And I made a promise Oprah to myself. Richer. Right. What's yeah. That? Could you imagine? You know, there was a study that came out that like she's like one of the very few people in the world that people get happy when she gets richer because of everything she's gone through. Oh, oh. So and I, I was like, that. that's true. I like I, that. I love seeing her. It's actually a really interesting study. Yeah. 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 OK. I want to wrap this up because we've had such an amazing conversation. I hate wrapping things up with you. I what hate... if the entire podcast was just like every conversation of ours? I know. We should just do that. Yeah. Idea. I think that's you a like great that? idea. Season two. 
<laughs> the other thing is we're both really like big nerds and we like to be like <laughs> yeah we like we, we will send each other send each other really gross from low and we're like <laughs> that should be like the cover so yeah this. that should be it wait th- didn't the daily like that was like the fo- the yes. daily whatever the daily the mail, mail. Yeah. yeah they love i mean i'll fart and they'll talk about it they love it it's ridiculous as long as you make this face while yeah. you're doing it that was so actual- I want to do a quick little uh, rapid fire question. So oh, I, this is going to be pretty big deal, pretty big things in your life. So you're going to finish okay. the sentence or tell me something that, okay. that we're good at finishing. Sentences. Okay. Ready? Pretty big car song. Oh, well right now I'm thinking about cold little heart. Cause that's what we sang in the car. Obsessed. Uh, pretty big birthday. Um, my 25th birthday, which is in November. And I'm more excited about this than any other birthday because I don't drink, so 21 didn't matter, but I'm so sick and tired of paying the young driver rental car fees. Oh. oh. November 27th. <gasps> yes. Oh. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's fun. Okay. Pretty big hero. My mother. Pretty big comfort food. Mac and cheese. Same. Pretty big recommend- Truffle mac and cheese. Like, I'm super bougie. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. Pretty big recommendation. Mm, to read forever. Oh, okay. I like that. <laughs> pretty, pretty big motto. Everything you want is just outside of your comfort zone. Mm-hmm. But just dropping knowledge. Pretty big little lies. Um, am I supposed to say a lie? No, you're supposed to say your favorite character on Little oh, Lies. I was like, wait. On Big Little Lies. On Big Little Lies. Um, Zoe Kravitz character. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I actually saw Renata, the woman that plays yeah. Renata at the at a Calvin Klein event last week, and I was just like, oh my gosh, Big Little Lies. But like, I didn't say anything. Hi, can I meet you? Hi. And then I, I, I kind of tried to say hi to her, and then she didn't acknowledge it, and I was just like, okay, I'm okay. just going to. See you later. <laughs> okay, Maybe tell me what's time. going on next. I know you've got Sold in America coming I out. I got Sold in America coming out. I in got progress. In Progress coming out. I'm going to crash on your couch in a few weeks. Yep. Um, and those are the two big things that I allow to talk about that are coming out. So let's okay. stick with those. I get it. Yeah. I understand. Uh, um, yes, I understand. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I know how that goes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for being here. Are you kidding? Don't thank I me. This is so my much. pleasure. You're I love best. you. This is a great love fest. Darcy love fest. Linda. Thank you. Thank you. Minata. You're great. Thank Sing God. for me You're again. Great. Right. And on my I- birthday, I want to. <laughs> singing recording yeah i'm on it i mean okay, reminder yeah. which version um surprise me okay got it perfect um and i also want to thank all of our sponsors and don't forget to go to pretty big deal on instagram and twitter we want to hear from you and don't forget to go to the anchor app and leave me a little voice message because i'm gonna be talking to you in the after party or the after show whichever one that's gonna be I Afterlife. <laughs> no not the afterlife <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for being here. Remember, you are bold, you are brilliant, you are beautiful. I'm Ashley Graham, and this is Pretty Big Deal. 